how does a collection agent get paid? Do they own the debt or just collect it? What's the best way to negotiate with them? Well, I've got an actual real live collection agent on the show with the answers starting right now. This is Debt Free in 30. Here's your host, Doug Hoyes. Okay, no intro. Let's get started. Who are you and what do you do? Oh, I am Blair DeMarco Wetlawfer. I'm the managing partner of Kingston Data and Credit, a collection agency that operates in Canada and the United States. Blair DeMarco Wetlawfer. Now, is it not true that you were actually a guest on episode number 20 <laughs> back January 17th, 2015, four and a half years ago? Well, I don't have my notes with me, but it is plausible. It's, it's, that's what my notes say. So so welcome back. Uh, you obviously did a great job because we've, we've invited you back uh, for four and a half years later. So on that show, we talked about, you know, how a collection agency gets involved and that sort of thing. And so we'll, I'll put a link to it uh, so that people can, can go back and and revisit that. Sure. I'd like to talk about big picture stuff with you. Okay. And these are questions we get asked all the time, all the time. So question number one, how do you get paid? Well, there are a couple different ways. The majority, uh, the 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 bulk of uh, the way that collection agencies get paid is a contingency or a commission. So when a collection agency collects money, they get to bill or keep a percentage of what is collected. And that could be as low as 5%. It could be as high as 55%, depending on the age and the nature of the debt. There are uh, clients that will pay people for, for just warm bodies or number of calls or, um, you know, for, for portfolio management, you know, time on phone, but the bulk of how agencies are paid are on a commission basis. Now, what is the difference between first party and third party? What does that mean? Okay. So third party, I call you from Kingston Data and Credit and say, Mr. Jones, this is Blair DeMarco Wetlawfer calling from Kingston Data and Credit. You owe XYZ Hydro $100. That's third-party collections. We're acting as a collection agency on behalf of another party. A third party, gotcha. Right. Uh, First-party collections, uh, what that is in, in our business, sometimes large companies like Shaw or you know provincial hydro companies don't have the staff or the wherewithal or the technology to make their own accounts receivable calls. So they hire a collection agency, not to call as a collection agency, but to call as XYZ Hydro. So I would call and say, hi, it's Blair calling from XYZ Hydro, even though I'm sitting in Kingston Data and Credit. Now, I'm not affecting their credit rating. I'm not, you know, it's literally the account's not delinquent. It's just keeping up on the accounts receivable that might be 30 days past due. Gotcha. And most of what you would do and most of what we think of as collection agents is the third party stuff. Right. So, um, so let's pick that company you do a lot of collections for, and we're not going to name them because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. There's lots of them. Let, let's say it's a credit card company. Sure. Very plausible example, right? Yeah. So the, you know, I, I have a credit card with, with that particular bank. I'm not paying it for whatever reason. At what point would it get turned over to you? So typically what happens is cre- XYZ credit card company calls you two, three, four times. You know, mm-hmm. Mr. Hoy is about that payment. The internal guy is calling right. me. Right. Um, you don't respond or you don't make the payment or whatever. Bang. They cut off your credit card. It no longer works. It's an empty piece of plastic. Mm -hmm. Um, They may try internally to call you again for another 15, 30 days. Then they turn it over to a collection agency. And so at what point then, how far are we since when I stopped paying to when you would get it? Uh, Typically 120 to 180 days, best case scenario. Now, some creditors are not well organized. They might. I'm stunned to hear that, but I, okay. I know, okay, I know. Yep. Uh, so they might build up a ca- or they might not have a high volume of accounts. So they might build up the accounts for six months and then send them to an agency. So it's possible we could get the account that even, you know, six or nine months past due when we get it for the first time. And how do they send it to you? Are they sending you a bunch of paper? Or what, how how <laughs> well, does this work? That's how it used to work in uh-huh. the old days. We'd pick up banker boxes. Yep. It doesn't work that way anymore. Usually they'll send it over electronically. Um, they'll either send it through our website or an FTP site. Obviously, with the, the data breaches that have been going on in the news, information security is a huge thing. When, when I was a manager of a collection agency in Hamilton, uh, TransUnion had an office down the street on Jackson Street. And literally, I would walk in with 
my three and a quarter inch floppy, you know, mm-hmm. back in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. And they'd say, oh, just leave it on the counter. We'll get to it whenever. Those days are gone. Yeah. Uh, so now now it's very important we get the information securely. So we might get uh, we might get an FTP file. We might have them download it to our FTP site. They might send it in encrypted form and we need a special password to unlock it. But 99 times out of 100, it's electronic. And so then it gets fed into your computer system, which right. obviously is secure as well. Right. And then, so so a typical batch that you get, and I know there's no such thing, but humor <laughs> me here. Sure. How many accounts potentially could be in that batch? Uh, anywhere from 10 to 10,000. And so if you get 10,000 files, let's yes. say it's that old cell phone company or something. That's why they're, right, they're so right, big. Right. 10,000 files, how are you going to approach collecting on that? That that exactly is the challenge. If you get 10 files, you feed them right to Rachel, who's the collector who handles this client. Calling. And they, she, it's a blip in her day because she makes 100 calls a day, throwing 10 in at the front, it doesn't interfere. And is that what a typical collector would do? About 100 calls a okay. day. Um, if they're making manual calls, mm-hmm. if they're using predictive dialing call, uh, dialers, which are you know horrible, horrible things, yep. they could make five, six, seven hundred calls a day. And that's where the robocaller is calling you. Right. And so I pick up the phone and there's nobody there and there's this 10 second leg. And that's because then... they built a bad predictive dialer. Ah, okay, yeah. I gotcha. And then, it, and then it comes on. Yeah. So how much predictive dialing do you guys use? Zero. Zero. I hate the machine. Hate the... Uh, so I worked at an agency once and they asked me, so how do you feel about... Uh, predictive dialers. I said, they're horrible brute force engines. I, I can't stand them. Well, we're getting 30 accounts, 30,000 accounts next week. Okay. I can make that work. Yeah. And then we're going to get 30,000 accounts the next week. Oh, I got to build a predictive dialer. Yeah. And I built one, but I hated every minute of it yeah. because you get, the problem is, uh, so a predictive dialer, the way it works is Susan, the collector sits down at her desk. She logs in, she puts on a headset. She, she jacks in like in the matrix, uh, into her computer and the predictive dialer says, Susan's available. And it makes four simultaneous calls for Susan. Uh, and if it's no answer, it hangs up after 45 seconds. If it's an answering machine, it leaves a pre-recorded call. If it's busy, it calls it back 10 minutes later. Somebody picks up and says, hello. It recognizes that's a voice and transfers the call to Susan. But the problem is Susan's calls aren't just Susan's calls. You have a call center with 20, 50, 100 people making 400 simultaneous calls. And when an avail- when a, somebody says hello, it looks for an available person. And if it's not built right, there's no available person. And that's why you get that pause. Mm. It's called a dropped or dead call. And, and when I built one, I tried to monkey with it because I'm half an IT person. And out of 120,000 calls a day, we had 20 of those. So it wasn't that bad. Hmm. But uh, the people who have the complaints... Somebody has just somebody who's uh, running a collection agency doesn't understand technology. They buy it, they turn it on, and they think everything's good. Now, if I was running a collection agency, I'd want to make as many calls as I possibly could. No, no, that is, and that's wrong. This is probably why I'm not running a collection agency. <laughs> because then. making making a million calls, you, you heard the term, you know, get a million uh, monkeys yeah. and put them at typewriters, and they'll type out the works of Shakespeare. It's not true. Collections is about negotiation. It's about reaching a person, understanding their circumstances, and and finding a middle ground where they can resolve it. You know, if you call Bob Smith and say, Bob, you owe $10,000. If Bob had $10,000 in his back pocket, he Probably wouldn't, would have paid. wouldn't be in collections. So, but the problem is Bob is stressed. Bob is scared. Bob is emotional. The last thing you want to do is have his phone ring every 10 minutes. So, so there should be a strategy to how you call people. In sales... Uh, collections is kind of the opposite of sales because you're not selling something they've already bought it. Um, but uh, sales says you try different um, channels. You know, you try email, you try calling, you try you know contacting them through LinkedIn. You know, to find that that way that a person wants to communicate. Consumers are no different. Some people, you know, back in the '90s or the '80s when I started collecting, you called somebody manually, and of course, five phones that are bolted to the wall all over their house start ringing, and everyone's yelling, "Would someone get that?" Now I call you, there's an 80% chance you don't have a landline. It's a cell phone. You see a 1-800 number buzzing. You don't know who it is. You swipe right. You put your phone face down. You don't talk to me. So, so collections now is about finding a way to have you want to pick up the call. So if you're just bombarding people with call after call after call, that is a failed effort. And, and sadly, some agencies have included in that we're in this thing called the 21st century where there's this marvelous thing called the internet and email and SMS. So they haven't caught up. 
So, and we're, I want to talk about this whole negotiation thing, but I mean, I, I met with somebody yesterday and I hear this story all the time that, yeah, I'm getting so many calls, I'm not answering them. Right, because they're beaten down. Yeah, and so they just, yeah, I, I don't answer them. So what I say to them is, okay, now that you filed your consumer proposal, you can actually pick up the phone, tell them you filed, give them our number, hey, we'll talk to Doug, them. call Doug, here's yeah, his number. <laughs> exactly, but I get it. If I'm getting 50 calls a day, I'm just ignoring them. It's, right. It's, it's not worth it. So, okay, so let's, I want to talk about negotiation because you hit on that, but let's finish off this whole thought then. So typically sometime between 120 and 180 days, although it could be six to nine months, you get a, a data a, a right. whack of files and then you go through using whatever secret sauce you have to say, okay, I'm going to sort them by this and call this guy first, this guy second, whatever. And I guess if I was doing it, I'd start with the bigger numbers or the most fresh ones or something a like that. Again, that's what most agencies do. And it's wrong. Wrong. So what we would do, let's- I got to take notes so when I start an agency- So when agency, you start your agency, do, yeah, uh, yeah. Hoy, Hoy's credit. That's right, yeah. Uh, so so what we do, say we get a batch of 10,000 files. The first thing that we'll notice out of the 10,000 files, 5,000 don't have phone numbers. Um, also, certain provinces require us to send a letter and wait six or seven days for them to respond. Some require a physical letter in the mail with a stamp like it's, you know, uh, you know Mayberry and mail it out. Fortunately, a couple provinces have, have caught up and they now allow those initial notices to go out by email. And so what is the rule in Ontario? You can email the letter. Uh, it has to have, the collection letter has to say who you're collecting on behalf of, what the balance is. If you have a breakdown like interest principal, list that. And Ontario requires a, a bill of rights, a list of if you're a consumer, here are your rights. And the, the Ministry of Consumer Affairs in Ontario says it must be word for word, this long list of verbiage. So when we send a physical letter, it's on the back and the collection notice is on the front. When you send an email, it's at the bottom. So before you can contact anybody, you have to notify them. Um, Yes and no. So if I have an email address or a mailing address, I can mail that. Now, if I don't have reliable information, say a credit agency goes, hey, I found these accounts in a box from five years ago. The numbers are out of service. The addresses are gone. There's, there's no, we are not required to mail a letter to an address. We know it's bad. Wait six days and then, you know, call. Uh, we are allowed to call now. Uh, they changed the laws in 2018 and they changed a couple things. We can call and do what's known as a limited uh, contact. So I can call you and go, Doug, I'm calling, you know, it's Blair calling from Kingston Date and Credit. I have a collection matter in my office. I'd like to send you a notice. Do you have an email address or a mailing address I can send you a notice to? Now, odds are you're going to go, Blair, what's this all about? And we'll actually start discussing it. But I have to offer you that letter. Gotcha. Uh, so, so there are ways you can contact someone without a letter. So back to this collection agency I'm starting. Sure, sure. So I've got this data dump of 10,000 files. Right. And so... Who do I call first? Well, how I would handle it. So the 5,000 that don't have phone numbers, I would send to the credit bureau to scrub. And you were in my office that one day mm -hmm. where I, I sent thousands of files to the bureau and I got a result back within 30 minutes. So I would do that and then bring in the new phone numbers from the credit bureau. Um, I would also start calling the files from the most recent delinquency forward. Because if you have just had an account go delinquent in the last three months, it's top of mind, it's urgent you're going to have a better response than the person who owes a debt from five years ago, regardless of the balance. Because you can't create a sense of urgency going, surprise, you owe this money from five years ago. Yeah, so start with the most recent one. And yeah. so if I've got a thousand files that were all from last month, well, then I guess then maybe I can sort by dollar value or something or whatever. Sure, but, sure. But it's the recency is where you're going to have the most ability to collect. One of the biggest challenges of running a collection agency is managing the inventory. Because you say I call you and, you know, for the first time I get your answering machine. I'm yeah, Doug, it's really important. You give me a call. I want to call you again in three business days. I want to create a sense of urgency without harassing you. Um, so I have rotation of files happening. Then I get new files. I need mm. to have collectors to work those files in a timely basis. And there are things like, oh, our credit manager's just gone on, you know, a, a sick leave. You won't be getting any files for six months. Well, you can't have your collection agents twiddling their Doing thumbs. Nothing. So it, it's a balancing act. You don't want to, you don't want to have too many files. You don't want to have not enough. And when a client drops 10,000 files, it can be a challenge. Now, the other thing, say say uh, we get these, uh, these 10,000 accounts. We're allowed to email notices in Ontario, BC, and Manitoba. We can send out the co initial collection notices. Uh, Ontario, BC require an initial collection notice. BC, uh, Manitoba doesn't, but they don't mind if you do. So we can send those out by email. 
what we've found since, since this law has come into effect, if I send out a thousand emails with an initial notice within an hour, a hundred people have paid Wow! because they don't want to talk to me. Yeah. They get a notice in their email. They click the hyperlink to our payment site. They pay it. It's painless. Done. You know, and, but that's for household debt, you know, $100, $200. It's not like you send someone a $30,000 yeah. notice, oh, it's paid. Uh, that requires negotiation or follow-up. But And then you get a lot of people communicating by email. Oh my God, what's this all about? And then you explain, well, I just got this account and here's... And sometimes the creditor hasn't handled the file. Like the creditor's supposed to call it internally. Sometimes they don't. Um, and then we get the account and the consumer is all up, up in arms. Oh my God, I had no idea and we have to diffuse the matter, we're actually the good guys in that scenario. Gotcha. Saying, no, no, it's fair you don't know about it. Here's what's going on. Nothing's happened. We haven't affected your credit rating. We want to help you. What do you want to do? So let's get to this negotiation thing then. Sure. So now it's a new scenario. I'm not running a collection agency anymore. It seems too complicated with all this managing <laughs> inventory and rules and everything. So I am the guy who is getting the phone call. Right. So the first scenario you gave was, okay, there was this $100 phone bill from six months ago that I completely forgot about it. I pushed the link, I pay it, I'm done. Easy. Sure. But let's say it is the $30,000 scenario you're talking about. I had this line of credit at the bank and a bunch of stuff happened. I lost my job. I wasn't able to pay. Now it's on your desk. Right. So what is the best approach that I should take as the person owing the money when I'm talking to a collection agency? How should I negotiate with you? Okay. Well, first of all, call us back. Um, mm -hmm. obviously if a collection agency calls and leaves an answering mach machine message, it's scary, but the collection agency, the, the consequences aren't going to go away. If you don't return your call, if you, if you play ostrich and stick your head in the sand, it's still going to hit your bureau. It's still going to accumulate interest. If the balance warrants it and the debts under two years, legal action could start. So the best and first thing somebody can do is call back. Okay. Now let's, you, you made two points there. Sure. Sure. So first of all, you said hit your bureau. What mm -hmm. are we talking about there? Okay. So so we get an account uh, and we're not a typical agency. Uh, so understand that other agencies will do things in a more simplistic manner. We get 10,000 files. We don't want to affect those people's credit rating. We want to work with them because ultimately if they pay the account, we get Everybody's our fee. happy. A everybody wins. Um, so what we typically will do is we'll list them on the bureau 60 days after we get them. So that gives us lots of time to reach out to the person. Now, that being said, uh, we call Bob Smith and Bob oh, about this hundred dollar account. And he says, burn in heck you rat bastard. Okay, it's going to the bureau today. You know, mm -hmm. clearly you don't want to take care of it. That being said, somebody says, oh my God, I'm so sorry. Can I, you know, I've lost my job. Can I pay a hundred dollars a month? Of course you can. And as long as they keep their arrangements, we'll withhold it from the bureau. Now, when we report to the bureau, we go in the registered items section. The bottom um, section of the Right, credit right, where you show up with your bankruptcies, yeah. I show up with collections, and legal accounts show up with judgments. Uh, so it's it's bad. And once it's on there, the bureau doesn't want us taking it off. So, and it's there for six years from the date of delinquency, seven if it's a judgment. So we don't want to do that if we don't have to. That's ultimately our leverage in 99% of the accounts we get. You know, we're not going to sue someone over $50. You know, the credit bureau is, is our leverage, and we report to TransUnion and Equifax in Canada. So ultimately we want that person to negotiate. We want to work with them and we want to be decent and keep it off their bureau. So you also mentioned two years. Oh, okay. So there's the legal uh, statute of limitations under the Limitations Act. If you owe $10,000, I have two years to sue you from the date of delinquency or acknowledgement of the debt. So you stop paying your credit card. The two year clock starts. Um, I contact you uh, and you say, oh my God, I'm so sorry. I want to make payment arrangements. While you're making payment arrangements, I might not sue you, but every time you make a payment, it resets the clock because you've acknowledged the debt with a payment. Right. So there, there's a two year window for the, cr and people get confused. They say, you can't affect my credit rating. It's over two years old. No, legal action can't happen for two years. Credit bureau reporting is six years from the date of delinquency or acknowledgement of the debt. Yeah. And so to be very specific on that two year rule, you can sue anybody for anything anytime you want, but if you were to sue me for a debt that's three years old, I could go to court and say, hey, judge, it's been more than two years, Limitations Act of Ontario. It is statute barred. Statute barred. And thrown out. And of course, you already know what the rule is, so you're not suing me for something for three years no, old anyways, because no. you know you're going to get kicked out of court and, and that wouldn't look good. So, okay, so number one thing is don't hide under a rock mm -hmm. call the call back you know let's open a dialogue because if if i just completely ignore it well okay you don't really don't really have any other choice here other than to send it to the credit bureau right. or perhaps now it's it would be very rare 
you know, tell me if I'm wrong here, but it would be very rare if you are the one starting legal action. No, no, we have three paralegals in our branches. We start legal actions all the time. And it would be rare if it's a hundred dollar account, I would assume. Totally rare. Yeah. Uh, our, our guideline, our internal guideline is the debt has to be at least $3,000. Yeah. So you're not starting a lawsuit for 50 bucks, but no. if it's 3000 or more, then, and, and that's even in a third party collection scenario. Right. And now we are going to pick and choose which ones we sue. If somebody owes $10,000 and they have no gainful employment, no assets. What's the point? Why would we sue it? We're throwing good money after bad and, and the client's paying us to, to, to file a claim in small claims court, which is the least expensive option. Beginning to end costs the creditor about eight hundred dollars. Yeah, so, so you... it's got there's got to be return, otherwise it's not worth it from their end. Now a lot of collection agencies, the the collectors aren't well trained, and they call and ah, oh, you owe two hundred dollars. I'm going to sue you if you don't pay. No, no, they're not. They're lying. Mm -hmm. um, now that being said, our guidelines three thousand dollars. But we re re represent Dr. Bob, the dentist. Oh, he bounced five checks on me. It's the principle of the thing. You know, we could be forced to to sue a file that's lower, um, or you know, we have multiple accounts and, you know, we'll sue one and call Bob Smith and go, okay, Bob, we sued on the one file. We don't want to sue on the others. Do you want to take care of this? Um, because a lot of people don't believe that legal action will happen or they don't understand. They, they think, you know, they, they watched, you know, Perry Mason on TV and, you know, oh, I just showed my age. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it, if, what happens is uh, if we sue a file and in Ontario, it's up to $25,000 in small claims court, we send out a statement of claim which is a court form with the attached documentation and why we think they owe what they owe. And we attach a copy of their signed contract or their statement of account or whatever to prove the debt, you know, for every penny and we sue it. And nine out of 10 people don't file a defense. They get this in the mail. It's scary. It's unknown. They just put it down. 20 days later, we can go for default judgment and then take 20% of their pay. And, and, you know, the people called, oh my God, what can I do? I'm sorry, it's too late. You, you know, when we called you, you should have called us. Now, that being said, we don't want to sue files even more than we don't want to affect someone's credit rating because it's expensive, it's lengthy, and uh, nobody wins. So it, you said it costs $800 roughly, roughly, and I get it. You got a court fee. You got to have someone show up in court the whole bit, send the, send the documents. Someone to serve them with the documents. Serve them with the paperwork yeah. and everything. Who's paying that 800 bucks? You? The, the client. The client is, yeah. The client. So you would have to have instructions for them that, yeah, we're willing to fork the money out to do that. And under the Collection Act, we need to have written permission. We can't just get 10,000 files and start issuing yeah. legal claims. We have to contact the client and say, we want to sue Susan Jones. You so know, give so us permission. In reality, even though you're the one doing all the stuff, it's really the original creditor who's doing the suing. I they're, mean, they're paying for it. They're driving the bus. They're driving the bus, yeah. right. Yeah. And so of that 10,000 files that you got yesterday... There, there's not going to be very many that you actually sue. We might sue five. Five out of 10,000. Maybe 10. Yeah. Like it's a minus, it's less than 1%. Yeah. Because we're looking for, because if somebody owes a significant amount of money and they're making payments, why would you them. sue them? Yeah. If, they're, if they owe a significant amount of money and they have no assets and aren't paying us. What's the point? We're not going to sue them either. We're only going to sue the people that are uncooperative with liquid assets that are not working with us. Yeah, so yeah. it would be a, a highly unusual thing, but you do have the the ability to do it. Right. So, okay, I'm negotiating with you. So step number one, call you back. Don't ignore it. Let's right. open a dialogue. Right. What other advice can you give me? Okay, make, make arrangements that you can keep. Don't, a, a lot of people get emotional about debt. And I'm sure you see that. Yes, I do. Um, don't promise something you can't do. Um, you know, don't call the agent. Oh my God, I'll pay half now and half later. If you can't afford half, then you don't end up paying it. You've broken arrangements with us. And to us, it looks like you're not able to keep your arrangements. Be honest. That being said, you know, don't say, well, I'll pay $10 a month on this $10,000 account. You know, try to, to, to explain your circumstances. And if we get a call saying, you know, we're a two income family. My husband just lost his job. We're struggling to get by until he gets work. Can we pay 50, hundred dollars a month? Sure. You know, we'll see their credit bureau. We'll see that they're struggling with everything. It makes sense. And their actions, not words, mm -hmm. talk, talk louder. So if they're making their $50 payments, we're not even going to bother them. Or we might say, okay, let's do this for 90 days. I'll check back with you in 90 days. See if your husband got a job. See if we can re, you know, up the payments because we, the client wants it resolved. The agency isn't going to get paid unless they're collecting money. Um, if they're getting a percentage, 
obviously the agencies are often motivated badly about payment in full or nothing. Go borrow the money. That's not the way it should work. It should be a reasonable payment arrangement. If someone wants to pay a bill over three months, sure. Six months, perfectly reasonable. Now, you said that your commission can be anywhere from 5% to 50%, depending on the file. If it's really old, it'd be higher, brand new, be, right, be less. Right. So somebody paying you 50 bucks a month. That's Isn't a, a lot. That's a lot of hassle for the $2.50 you're going to make. <laughs> Potentially. But ultimately, it, it's about it's about uh, working with people in the least painless way. If someone calls and say, I could pay $50 a month. Here's my checking account. You can take this $50 a month out on the 20th of each month. Great. So There's, it's not a lot of work for you to It's not a lot of work once it's set up. And then we call in 90 days. Oh, you know, no, husband still doesn't have a job. Okay, let's do it another 90 days. We're calling the person once every three months. And as long as the payment's clear, that's fine. So don't ignore it. Call back. Don't make a promise you can't keep. Explain, be realistic, and actions speak, speak louder than words. So frankly, common sense. Right. And talk about the big picture. If you owe 50 people and you owe $600,000 say that and you know the agency if they're if they're being reasonable going well why haven't you talked to a bankruptcy trustee you'll never get out um if if you're if you say look i'm currently being garnished or you know i'm currently and my hours have been reduced at work you know but uh, one of the things you can do obviously there are people that contact us and say i can't do anything well we have to follow through with the consequences now we have to affect your credit rating one of the options you have is look i can't there's nothing i can do right now i just lost my job i'm going to make a good faith payment of 20 bucks uh, you know, to show you, I actually want to take care of this. And that'll, if you do talk, if you propose that to an agency, it will often get them to back off for 30 days where they don't call you. They don't send letters and it gives you a chance to get your, your feet in under you and get your life back on track. Yeah. And, and I would counter that by saying, if this is a debt, that's a year and a half old. Right. No, no, no. You're right. It will reset the clock. Um, so, but, so don't make a payment unless you're yeah. committed to paying the I know the that I'm balance. back to work in a month. So give you 20 bucks now. I can, I can continue right. on with payments. Yeah. Right, right. You got to be, be careful. And yeah, so, absolutely. and, and I like the plug you put in there, to, you know, for, you know, go talk to a licensed insolvency trustee, because <laughs> if you have, if you've got debt that you can pay back, then you should pay it back. Right. Now, here's the thing that we see. We see people who owe a ton of money. Um, you know, they owe five payday loan companies that are charging them 59.9% interest and, and they are treading water. They're paying four to $500 a month in interest and they're not improving their situation. And, and in a lot of cases, when they explain that to us, I'm like, oh my God, go to a nonprofit credit counseling company that'll get you an unorderly payment of debt program. Go to a trustee, you know, who can do a consumer proposal. You know, we'll start with the credit counseling because it's free. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we, you know, say trustee after not that. Not really free because they charge a fee and- They uh, charge a, the creditor a fee. Well, not, oh, they charge- The, the nonprofits, the nonprofits. No, they charge a really? fee too. Yep. The standard, this, this is good that you're on the no, show. No, no. Yeah. Hey. The, the standard now, and I can show you documents because my clients bring them all the time, is they typically will charge a 10% fee. So if you've got $50,000 worth of debts, they'll set you up on a debt management plan where you pay $50,000 back plus $5,000. Well, I understand that from the debt settlement companies, but I'm talking like Catholic Family Services and those nonprofit ones. Yeah, they don't exist anymore, but yes. Yeah. You know, I can show you the documents. No, no, I know yeah. the debt settlements. Yeah. Actually, no, these, are, these are the, the not-for-profit agencies. And yes, you're right. They're also getting a contribution back from the creditors. Potentially, yeah. Potentially, not all of them. Not all Some of them. them say, no, forget it, I'm not paying anything. But now in some cases, <laughs> cases, if it's, you know, you got two hydro bills and they're going to help you work it out, they may say, fine, we'll do it for nothing. We're not going to sure. charge you anything. But if it's th their standard contract says you're paying a 10% fee over and above what the what the debts are. Right, right. And debt settlement companies, people have to watch out for yeah, that. Yeah, that, that's basically borderline illegal in a lot of well, cases. Well, it's regulated now. Highly regulated. Highly yeah. regulated because of those bad actors. And they charge 10 or 15%. The law actually caps them at yeah. 10 or 15%. But ultimately, if a person's treading water on interest, they're not going to get out of debt. If they can't pay down their debt in seven years, they should go bankrupt. Absolutely. Because the, the, ultimately, you should be in a win-win scenario. The person should be able to pay the debt, get out of debt, and, and hopefully never get in that situation again. And I guess from your point of view, there's not a whole lot of point in making phone calls over the next six months if you're not going to get anything anyways. If the person can't make the payments, then yeah, do well, a proposal and, and be done with it. Right. Now, we do have people uh, that shockingly don't react well when they're told they mm -hmm. owe money. And uh, we will affect their credit rating. And we will call them every 90 days and go, you know, hi, Bob. Uh, I'm updating your credit bureau. Have you filed for bankruptcy or consumer proposal? Here 
here's your balance with compound interest. Do you have any questions? And, and uh, you know, often people, oh, I, I'm not emotional about this anymore. I want to take care of it. I, you know, yeah. So often people will repay when we, when we touch out, but it's a light touch. It's not a go get the money. You yeah. know, that, the day of agencies being hardcore is, is almost gone. Yeah, some of them still do, but as you've already demonstrated, it it doesn't work in a lot of cases. So final question then, let's talk about hardcore. <laughs> I believe the word is harassment. Okay. So, because I get people coming in all the time saying, oh man, they're harassing me. Well, what they're really doing is you're on a robocall that is calling you every hour. Right. And as you've already dis you know described, if they don't have a very good system set up, their predictive dialer doesn't really work, you're getting bombarded with you. It's not actually a human being sitting there dialing your phone every hour. That would be unusual. And not very cost effective. Yeah, ridiculous. Right. Uh, ridiculous. But, you know, they say, oh, I'm, I'm being harassed. So what is it that a collection agency is allowed to do? Okay, in Ontario, it's defined uh, how often you're allowed to call people. Some of the provinces are vague, but so, Ontario... So let's stick with Ontario okay. then, because that's a so simple example. Ontario says, okay, I'm trying to reach you, Doug. Until I talk to you for a first time, I can call you as often as I want. Once I talk to you, once I've made contact with you, I may not speak to you more than... Th may not attempt to speak with you any more than three times every seven days. So every other day, I can I can try to reach out to you. Now, if you call me and I'm returning your call, that doesn't count. Um, or uh, there are a couple other minor exceptions. But generally speaking, me as an agency owner, I try to call people every three business days. So I'm calling people slightly less than twice a week. Um, and then, uh, you know, say we have a bunch of people we've labeled as avoids contact. We might send out a mass email or a mass SMS saying, please call us. So I'm well within that three times in seven days. And generally, I observe the three times in seven days before I reach up the person initially because I don't want to set a bad tone. Yeah. So, but again, I'm unusual in our industry. I understand that, which is why I wanted to have you on. <laughs> because frankly, you've got a job to do. Right. And if nobody ever tried to collect money from anybody, then I guess nobody would ever pay and the whole economy would collapse. So even though, you know, people may not like what you do for a living, people may not like what I do for a living, I guess people don't like what doctors do for a living either. They're always, you know, <laughs> well, only if it turns out bad. That's right. So, but we have to have these functions in an economy or else right. everything breaks down. Well, so one of the things that we do after a person pays us, we send out an email to them saying, here's a link to our Google business page. How do we treat you? Ah. And three out of four, give us a positive review. Now, one out of four, yeah. they're not happy. Yeah. But, uh, uh, and uh, because the whole thing is, Ultimately, collections is about one human being talking to another human being and saying, what are we going to do about this? And there's negotiation, getting back to your point about negotiation. Ultimately, if people you know, knew about their debt, had the means to pay their debt, and there were no consequences that they were worried about, th it would be a wonderful world. Yeah. But ultimately, a collection agency needs to call and say, okay, Bob, we have an A, B choice. Here are the consequences. Here's the debt if you want to work with me. What do you want to do? And Bob, Bob's in the driver's seat. The consumer's in the driver's seat. He can say, go to hell. I don't want to pay it. Go with the consequences. Or I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. Go ahead with the consequences. Or I want to work with you. How can I deal with this? And ultimately, agencies have a lot of power. Um, if you call the agency, they often have the power to freeze the interest accumulating on an account. Um, if the consumer has a lump sum, they can often negotiate a settlement where they pay a percentage of the debt. Now, get it. the consumer should always get it in writing first before paying the lump sum. So just out of curiosity, my debt's a year old. Sure. And it's $10,000. Okay. And I go talk to my mother and she says, well, okay, I can help you out a bit. I can't give you 10, but I can give you... So what kind of a lump sum would be reasonable for a debt? Let's say it's a year old. Um. Oh, depends on the industry. Like if a hydro company sends an account, they often won't have settlement parameters. A credit card company that's sending to five different agencies, they don't want to get a call every time a settlement comes up. They will give uh, agencies what's called a blanket settlement permission. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, you can settle any account for 70% or more. Um, so the, the agency has the wherewithal. A year old, 70, 80% would be uh, roughly what could be accepted. Now, if there's a hardship situation, you know, uh, you know, my spouse just died. Um, you know, I, I've been diagnosed with stage two cancer. I, you know, I have no income. You know, if, if there are extenuating circumstances, you know, I just was sued and my house was lost. If the person tells us, here's the circumstances, here's what I can try to do. Again, the person's reaching out, attempting. 
it's not any trouble at all for us to contact the, the, the creditor and go, here's their situation. They're offering something. Would you like to accept it? And, and again, we have the Consumers Bureau. It backs up their, their yeah. you know, they're driving a $200,000 Beamer. Mm, uh, you know, that's different. But, you know, if, they, if they're in a hardship situation, they have multiple judgments. We can present that to the creditor and say, what they're offering is the best you're going to get. You should take it. And we're actually the advocate for the consumer in that case because the consumer is trying to yeah. work with us. And everybody wins. Right. And if it was a three-year-old debt, well, I know you can't sue me. Right. In that case, I assume you're willing to 50, settle. 50, 60%. Uh, again, it depends on the creditor. It depends on the circumstances. Um, some creditors are hardline. Nope, 100% or nothing. Um, some creditors are, are more than willing to bend. Um, when Wonga was in Canada, they were very reasonable. Um, but they, they had a whole platform where they didn't charge the consumer's interest after 60 days, you know, that yeah. sort of thing. So, so it depends on the, the creditor because the creditor is still driving the bus. But if the consumer reaches out with a lump sum offer, that's reasonable. Now, some consumers say, well, can I pay $50 a month until I've paid 50% of the debt? No. It's, yeah. it's lump sum or, pay or payment, but the agency can still freeze the interest. Um, or if the consumer says, I dispute the quality of service I've received, you know, I want, you know, and they have a justification for knocking 30% of the debt off, that could possibly be knocked off before they start making payments. And then they could make payments. Those are, there are different scenarios. So when I'm negotiating with you, you know, might as well ask to have the interest frozen at the very least. Absolutely. And if a person's making a payment plan, it only makes sense because if a person's paying fifty, a hundred dollars a month, if it's accumulating interest, they're treading water yeah. again. No we're one not, wins. We're not getting anywhere. So, yeah. okay. Well, I mean, I think that's that's fantastic and very practical advice. Um, you know, call back. Don't make a promise you can't keep. Be realistic. Actions speak louder than words. Ask to have the interest frozen. Make sure you explain the whole big picture. And it's not like as a collection agent, it's like, well, I got to get every last dollar, even if it makes making 50 phone calls over the next six months, because it's actually no. not productive for you as well. Big picture, when we get 10,000 accounts from a credit card company, we have a fairly good idea of what percentage of those 10,000 accounts will collect. And often the client will say, you must collect X percent of these accounts. So we work towards the big picture. You know, if, if Bob Smith gets, you know, oh, you're just calling me because no, no, we're working towards a big picture goal. You know, if we're assigned $10 million and the client expects us to collect $1 million in six months, we're looking towards that. And if a person's made payment arrangements, we often will go back to the client and say, okay, we've collected half a million dollars and this, this other half a million dollars are in payment arrangements and they're all on track. You know, the client's happy, the consumers are happy because they've made arrangements they can make. We're happy because we get to keep the lights on and pay our staff. Uh, so ultimately, uh, we're looking at it from a big picture standpoint as well. Excellent. And yeah, and, and the big picture standpoint I would, would tell everybody is if you can pay it back, do it. But if it's such an overwhelming amount that there's just no way you can, because you're trying to collect 5000 from me, but I got 50000 of other people. But do something about it. But don't, do something about it. Don't yeah. just hide from it. Because ultimately... If, if, if you're in a horrible, horrible situation, and if you file bankruptcy, at least you know seven years from now, you're starting fresh. Yeah. The longer you wait, the longer you're, you're offsetting that seven year mark. Yeah. Or Be if it's a consumer proposal, you can um, uh, uh, you know mitigate part of that balance. Yep, absolutely. So you're right, take action. I guess whether you're de dealing with the collection agent directly or whether you're doing a proposal or a bankruptcy, right. take action. Now, another thing on harassment, if a consumer, and I get asked this a lot, uh, if a consumer says stop calling and they send it to us in any recorded format, it used to be registered mail, but now if they send it by email, by fax, by letter, if they ask us to stop calling and communicate with them in writing only or by email only, the agency in Ontario has to abide by that. Hmm. Now, of course, that might mean we're just going to turn it over to the Bureau or sue you or something. Right, right, right. But ultimately, if consumers feel that they're being harassed, they do have recourse. Or, you know, if they find the calls are disruptive because their cell phone's going off while they're at work and they'd rather communicate by writing, you know, the, the agency has to abide by that. Gotcha. Yeah. And of course, you've got to deal with the underlying problem. That's the best way to make the call stop. Yes. So pay it, do the proposal. Well, or, whatever and, and if you call back, the calls will suddenly cease because they've reached you, they've made arrangements. Yeah. And that's that's what I tell people too. You might as as well might as well deal with it yeah but talk to talk to the agent in a non-emotional tone you know let them say their spiel and often 
agents are badly trained. They're in a stressful situation. You know, you have to collect this much money or you're fired. You know, they're under stress too. It's a bad situation uh, for everybody involved. So let them say their piece and say, okay, here's what I'm willing to do. Or, yeah, and if you get an agent that's emotional, say, okay, this call isn't going well. Can I get your email address? Let's communicate by email. Cause that way there's a paper trail and that emotion is taken out of it. You know, you don't get that when you're typing emails back yeah. and forth. That's another option. Yeah, and that's a very good point. You forget that there's someone at the other end of the phone. Yeah. And it's not like the collection agent loves harassing people. Of course, they're not harassing, but you know, it's they've they've this is the 87th call they've made today. They've been sworn at. They're you right, know, they're having right. a hard day, and whatever. We, we see horrible things. We see people using their eight year old child to screen calls. We see people who lie, uh, um, you know, constantly because, but ultimately the underlying thing is, we're calling people who are emotional and and that can't help but rub off on the collection agent after a while someone will will hit a nerve and the collection agent will react badly so my job as a collection agency owner is to try to not have that kind of an environment and try to educate my staff um but even still you might have a collector who you know who's been told to do horribly rude things and the collection agent doesn't like it uh so ultimately take the emotion out of it. You know, obviously, yes, the consumer owes money and that's stressful. Yes, the collection agent has been lied to, you know, 12 times that day. And, you know, this is the 87th call. That's stressful. But ultimately, the goal is to work towards resolution. I like that. Take the emotion out of it. Yeah. That's an excellent way to end it. Now, how can people track you down? I know in the past you've had a blog. Do you still, still do, do that? It. Still so do it. How can people find your uh, blog? So my, my blog is at uh, receivableaccounts.com. And actually, I have a number of consumer awareness articles and credit management best practices articles on there that people are welcome to use. Uh, I also have links to the credit bureau on there if people want to find their credit rating and see what's on there and what it looks like. Excellent. Receivableaccounts.com. That's a, a great resource. Blair, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Blair DeMarco Wetlaw for an actual real live collection review. That's our show for today. Thanks for listening. Until next week, I'm Doug Hoyes. That was Debt Free in 30.